Welcome to part two of We Welcome Our Robot Overlords on this week's episode of Semi-Retired. Self-destruct initiated. Self-destruct cannot be countermanded. Dave, what big movie came out in 77? 77, let's see. The droids of Star Wars, <laughs> C-3PO, who always annoyed me, and R2-D2, who didn't annoy me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. C-3PO was like that smart-ass guy in class who's always correcting the teacher. Yeah, like the foppish, English, you know, accented servant robot who was always like a little bit neurotic sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Even the mannerisms, eh? the arms yeah. and the head movements. Yeah. And, and you're right, the jerky walking yeah. was kind of... Uh, was, was kind of odd it yeah. wasn't the uh, it wasn't the smooth flowing robot because he's he's a protocol droid right he's, yeah. he's just the, basically there to uh to tell you wh- what's right and what's not oh which that, that's spoon right to use. protocol droid yeah. right yeah. oh yeah i forgot because in the future it's very important that you know which spoon to use when you're eating sand i don't know that now <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah and r2d2 obviously uh yeah, yeah coming straight out of uh, silent running again you can see if you look at the the images of them listeners yeah. you'll see exactly where the inspiration came from also had a little guy inside uh, uh, probably, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there you have the popularization of robots as friendly. Yeah. There are no, in the early ones, I don't think there are any uh, antagonist uh, robots. So. It, comes, so. it comes in the prequels later, you have the, uh, the yeah. droids. Yeah, and they're the, friendly, yeah. almost comical, the two of them, you know? Yeah, oh yeah, and they're constantly yeah. ribbing each other. And, and the beauty yeah. is R2-D2 doesn't speak a language we understand, but right. C-3PO knows what bleep blorpa means, yeah. right? You yeah, know? that's right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> bleep, yeah bleep blorpa. And so from there, we start to get into... Uh, a little more it's, it's shifting again we went back to friendly droids now we, we have I, I guess we could talk about the two alien movies together right? I think we alien and them aliens. Together, aliens yes and so in the first one we have Ash who is a uh, an android un- he's an, an android an unbeknownst to everybody right that's right yeah, yeah. yeah they think he's just a crew member and it turns out anybody who hasn't seen Alien all three of you this spaceship returning from a, a an ore gathering mission its crew is in hibernation it's what the crew's woken up they're being instructed to check out a signal from a planet planet that they're orbiting or they're going to orbit and they encounter the alien and try to avoid contaminating the spaceship with said alien uh, but ash who richard mentioned uh who's the science officer on the ship turns out to be a plant from the corporation that's financed this expedition. Wait, is he a robot or a plant <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hold on a second let me think that through so he's yeah, a plant robot and ash is really there to make sure that this alien specimen is actually captured and successfully returned to earth crew is expendable exactly he receives those instructions from the headquarters yes. and that goes against the the, the kind of the, the the thinking of the rest of the crew, right? Yes. And so, how do they discover that he's a an alien again? Somebody like whacks his head off with a baseball bat, I think. Well, that's right. That's right. His head gets knocked off, and that's when they realize yeah. he's he's yeah. he's, he's a, actually he's an not android. human because there's all this kind of milky stuff leaking out of his neck oh, and all yeah. that stuff. Business there, yeah. <laughs> the robots don't have blood; they no, have yeah. milk. So that was a, that was a shocker at the time. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, and they played that theme with androids in all. I think almost all of the uh, the alien movies. Yeah, it was right? part of the alien. Uh, I think universe, like you said, aliens, like which is like seven years later, 1986. There's another android there. Uh, name escapes me at the moment. Bishop, you're right, That's Bishop. Right. I'm not bringing the story to mind. Maybe you do. I can't recall. Uh, well, that one they know from the start that Bishop is an android, right? Here at this point, okay. And so uh, they know, and so uh, Ripley obviously does not believe uh, anything he says. She doesn't trust him, having had the experience with Ash. With Ash, that's so right. So there's, there's confrontation there, but he turns out to be okay because he comes continues on into the third movie. Okay, so the android species or race here redeems itself through Bishop. As opposed to Ash, Bishop ends up making it through the movie. Uh, so from there, we get into our more uh, notorious uh, uh, robots. From the early 80s, we have Blade Runner. Uh, the replicants of Blade the Runner. The replicants, yeah. One I, of my favorite movies, by the way. Same here. I, yeah. I, I have to say, I've never tried to do this, but it's got to be top, it's, it's top five. Oh, is it really? Okay. Yeah, it's top five. Okay, sure. Great movie, great sound sound effects in yeah. there. Yeah. Just the sound of it puts Beautiful you... Beautiful visuals. Always raining. Everything. Yeah, oh, always yeah, raining yeah. and dark. Yeah. Mm. So in there, we have Replicants, right? Which are produced replicants, by... that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah by the... Uh, Terrell Corporation. Terrell Corporation. That's right. Those great glasses Mr. Terrell wears. Yeah. Right? So essentially, our, our hero in the movie is there to uh, look for replicants who have... Uh, replicants who have escaped from, I guess, their job. What you're given to... You're given to understand is the replicants replicants are being used for dangerous tasks. Uh, In this case, I love this sentence. These replicants escape from an off-world colony 
and they're like a kick murder squad or something. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They escape from an off-world kick murder squad or something. Yeah. It's such a dense piece of dialogue and delivers so much information or, or flavor about the society. At any rate, they've come back to Earth, have these replicants. And the key here is that it's extremely difficult to detect a replicant. In fact, the opening scene of the movie shows somebody trying to detect one. They're virtually indistinguishable from human beings. And these replicants have come back because they're pissed off and they're looking for their creator. And they're looking for their, their termination date, right? Because they have yes. a, a built-in fixed, is it four years? I think it's a four-year oh, lifespan. Four. And they know that somehow, and that's pissing them off. And this is where you get, for the first time, you get into the morality of creating android life yeah. like this, because they have feelings. They don't want to die. They want to prolong themselves, and they're resentful, feel resentment towards Terrell Corporation, uh, headed by, I think it's Miles Terrell. Around this conflict, the whole movie revolves and Deckard, rather, the Harrison Ford character, as a Blade Runner, is literally trained to hunt down replicants. Mm -hmm. That's his job. That's yeah. what a Blade Runner is. It's beautiful. And I think it's more than just feelings. It, the, here we start to see robots with consciousness or yes. sentience. Like, they yes. know of their existence. And it's not just the fact that they are a machine or a creation to do a task. Yes, you're right. Now they, they need to know about their maker. They want to meet their maker. They want to know why they have... A fixed lifespan or it's like they, they've become self-aware yes. of more than just their task to do yes. but their actual existence in the greater scheme of thing and, and obviously feel resentful that they're going to have a short life in fact I think when uh, one of them is talking to Miles Terrell just before killing him actually and basically saying like why did you do this to us and I think Terrell says something like uh, the, the light that burns twice as bright lasts half as long yeah. trying to justify what he's done by giving them a, a, a short lifespan and in and he says, and you you have burnt very bright, haven't you? Yes, yes that's uh, right. You burnt this. So, yes. So, yes. Bright, yeah. So, uh, interesting that they, they are a kill squad, yet at the end, uh, he doesn't doesn't go through with his mission to, to kill Decker. Right? That's right. He pulls back. Roy Batty, we're talking about, is yeah. the... Uh, and he, he's like the most advanced of the replicants that are in this in this renegade group. He's a, uh, I don't know, a Nexus 6 combat model or something. So high intelligence, high physical strength. And he pulls back from the edge of killing Deckard, who's been hunting him, and delivers that terrific oh, Tears yeah, yeah. in the Rain soliloquy, which gives you a sense of the soul that he has, you know? And he says something like, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I've watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tenhauser Gate. All these things will be lost in time, like tears in the rain. Time to die. And he dies. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's actually quite beautiful. And it's, it's I think it's, very it's, moving. It's the probably the most enigmatic moment of, of, a, of a sentient or, yes. or, or a non-sentient being showing sentient emotions or consciousness. I think so. Yeah. It's uh, it's one of cinema. I think one of cinema's great moments. And from that, we go into our our friend Ani. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no sentience, whether in real life or as a Terminator. <laughs> He'd probably argue the point. But, probably uh, he would. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we we get to the Terminator movies, which. Now we're really going full bore killing machine. He's sent back in time to eliminate someone who's going to have a, a child who will lead the rebellion in the future against the machines when the against machines the take machines. over. Yeah, right. great time travel story. Yeah, it's a great. We've talked about time travel yeah. before. It's a it's a great time travel yeah. one, and they explore it a little bit too much in in subsequent movies and, and, and sequels. But yeah, he comes back. He's basically a cyborg. He looks human, and then there's that great scene where he appears and he's naked. Yeah, and he just he scans around. You're not sure what's going on, and he starts. You know, his HUD comes up, and you start to see things appear on his HUD. Yeah, and he identifies people, and he's looking for clothes. Right, he's looking yeah. for sizes of clothes, and. Through his cameras in his eyes and his, his computer brain, he can estimate the sizes of clothes. And he goes to the obviously to the bikers and he asks them for their clothes. That's and so right. On. Great opening sequence. Fantastic. Right? Yeah. The fighting in the bar, oh, uh, yeah. and then driving off with the motorcycle. Right. The Terminator, the T eight hundred model Terminator in this case, is a relentless, unthinking killing machine with extreme strength and reflexes and ability to use weapons. And he's looking for the mother of the young boy that yet to be born that Richard mentions. Yeah who will have such an impact on the future John from Connor. which he came. John Connor. And uh, yeah, single purpose machine, but very adaptable to its surroundings, right? Like it, it can take in new info. It's not just like you're sending in your Roomba, which can <laughs> vacuum the floor yeah. and, you know, can't distinguish from, you know, dog puke to uh, to dust, right? It'll just run over it. Well, yeah, he can, he can uh, mimic human voices, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he picks that up. Tech. Yeah, yeah tech. you see, he makes he makes some calls here or there. Or at one point, he'll imitate the voices. That's right. You see it a lot more in the second one, in, Termin in yeah. T2. 
And yeah, relentless throughout the whole movie, constantly, constantly coming after the other woman to kill her and until it gets destroyed. Giant quotation marks on destroyed here at the end and it's light goes out. So uh, yeah, He's like more durable than the uh, the killer, Mike Myers, in Halloween, right? He keeps yeah. coming back for more. Like the Energizer Bunny. Like the Energizer Bunny, yeah. Which is <laughs> what made it great. Like he just, you know, he just couldn't kill him, couldn't kill him, couldn't oh, kill yeah. him. Even yes. when they blow up the truck, right? And yeah. he, and he died. Yeah, and then that's he, right. Then, he comes out and all the skin has burnt off and yeah. it's just the, that metal skeleton coming after yeah. you. Which is like, wow, that was a great scene to see that in the movies. Yeah. Like, today, kids would, you know, yawn and Probably, whatever. Yeah. But uh, at the time, this was a great special effect. Yeah. 100%. And it needs to be said that it is a perfect role for Arnold yeah. and his limited acting uh, palette. Throughout T2, uh, T1 and, and, and Terminator 2, which we'll get to next, he, he's basically a series of one-liners, right? He learns yeah. things, he adapts to popular culture of the time, yeah. and, you know, he has the zingers, which become, you know, yeah. you know, uh, I'll be back. Uh, the famous lines that, that that we think of when we think of, uh, of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, there's almost a touch of campiness in there, right? Yeah, and I think yeah. it's done... On purpose? Yeah, it yeah. is. A little it, bit. It is. Because you know, I mean, if you have a robot who's too high thinking, I, I, you can't see C-3PO with, with muscles no. trying to do the job here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I must terminate you now. Yes. <laughs> Please succumb. Yeah, that's really <laughs> annoying, that voice you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. And so a movie ends. Everything is good. She drives away, realizes she's pregnant. Because at the same time, they've sent back another. Yeah. Uh, they've sent back, um, I forget his name, to help out. Uh, he's a soldier who sent right. back to defend, help her defend against. Uh, the ones of being the father of the, of the son. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's one yeah. of those. Uh, yeah. When you think yeah. about it, right? So we get to the second movie. Very different feel. The intro with uh, Linda Hamilton in the insane asylum. Yes. Working up. She's like this very... The mother of John Connor. That's right. Yes. She's very... <laughs> she's very... I don't want to say demure, but rides a little scooter. Almost... You could almost see her in floppy hats in, in the first movie. Yeah. And then in the second movie, when you cut to the intro and she's training in her room and she's now buff. Yeah, she's buff. Eh? She's, she's buff. ripped and buff and hard yeah. ass. Yeah. Exactly. And when she... Uh, she has her action sequence at the beginning and really takes it out on them you're like wow what a transformation from meek and demure and helpless to that. now empowered and with a mission and of course our friend arnie comes back he plays the same model right he, he's the again t800 he's still a t800 he's a t800 he comes back and obviously now the sun is here and he goes after the sun and tells him you know well, you gotta come with me come with me if you want to live or is that in the first no, one that's, that's, no, i think you're right yeah. that's it now arnie comes back and now he's a benevolent robot yes he's, he's a benevolent the, killing he's there machine to protect the boy yeah who's gonna eventually grow up and wreck the society from which he came Right. I have to keep reminding myself. <laughs> That's right. And so they go and they pick up the mom and she's terrified because she only remembers him as the killing machine who yes. tried to eliminate her in the first one. Yes. And then we get introduced to this other robot, the T-1000. Oh, yeah. Which was just amazing at the time. Liquid Man, right? I mean, yeah. that scene when he goes through the bars. Through the bars, yeah. And then it's beautifully done because his gun doesn't go through. You remember that? Yeah, he goes clunk, through and clunk. Yeah. And then he just turns very slowly, looks, and yeah. then rotates the gun and takes it through the yeah. bar. He can transform himself, but things he takes with him can't. And it was really well done. I mean, you look at it today, it's probably not as, doesn't look as great as it was but back I, then, yeah, but it was right. mind that, bending. That shot at the time. was the mind bender. Yeah. You're right. When he walked through the, uh, yeah. the barred gate. The bars there, going through his face. And he's liquid metal. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah, that was very crazy. cool. And again, here we have a, a, an android like shape, and I forget they explain exactly what he's made of, yeah. and he's, he's like really unkillable. We have a prolonged longed you know, fight scene between the two of them over and over oh, during I love the movie. That, eh? They're smacking the shit out of each other yeah. in that shopping mall. Oh, yeah. And, and neither of them is talking. Of course, they're neither of them because they're just both robots and they're just killing each other or wailing on each other, yeah. shooting each other in the back. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> boom, boom, yeah. boom. You, you get know? those great shots where he shoots Liquid Man in the head with the shotgun and it yeah. makes like this deformed thing as if you've taken liquid yeah. metal and pushed something through it and then the head sort of comes back in. Yeah, just yeah. Re reforms itself, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's... He's, he's like unkillable. They, yeah, they, unkillable. they freeze him at one point and shoot yeah. him with a shotgun and he shatters in a million pieces and then yeah. the heat kind of melts the pieces That's back right. down. They all come back together. Yeah. yeah. He reforms again. Yeah. yeah. So, and he has to be thrown into the uh, in the blast furnace at the end. There. That's, That's how they, it. They, they, Blast, Arnie yeah. goes down with him, right? Got and him melt, the blast melts, furnace. Yeah. right. Yeah. I won't be back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we have two robots here. We have what was a, a malevolent robot becoming benevolent, yes. fighting a malevolent robot again. And yeah. Back, back. So we have robots uh, beating the crap out of each other. It's getting complicated. Yeah, it's getting complicated. Far cry from Rosie the uh, the maid. 
<laughs> yeah, Rosie the maid. I don't know what Rosie would have done in this situation, but uh, maybe beat him with a feather duster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Stuck it exactly. in the servos. Vac- <laughs> vacuumed his head, yeah. So if we're talking robots, uh, Dave, I know you haven't seen the series, but we have the great series Futurama, which has many robots, but one of our main characters is Bender, the friendly robot. Oh, it's a series, not a movie. I didn't <laughs> no, realize that. It's a series. It's the same guy who did The Simpsons. Okay. It's, it's like 3D-ish. Some parts are 3D. Oh, too. but animated then. Animated. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you have Bender who's like... Sounds friendly. <laughs> he's basically a bending robot. He bends things. Oh, I see. That, that's oh, why he's I called see. Bender. That's, the, that's his purpose. But it obviously... is to bend things. Is to bend things. Okay. But he's gone off the rails. He does not a bending robot. He's like he's like your drinking buddy. He drinks. He has a, a door that opens up in his stomach that where he has things. He's always got something well, in that's there. That's what I had going on a bender is like sort of getting <laughs> smashed out of your mind, right? And well, like, yeah. That's pretty much right. I guess where the inspiration came uh, from. Maybe, he does yeah. I mean he does all kinds of crazy things. Okay. He, he burps, he drinks, he fornicates. <laughs> <laughs> he goes crazy. Regular dude, eh? Yeah. And there's a, there's a great scene in one of the episodes where Bender loses both his arms. And then they cut to the next scene and he's putting his, one of his arms back on. Uh, and it's always like, how did you get the first one back? <laughs> right. <laughs> how did you do yeah, wait that? wait a second, eh? Yeah. And, and, and we always, uh, my wife and I always make that joke, oh, this is Bender's arms. Whenever you watch a movie and something's happened and they cut to the next scene and how did how did you get from there to there? It's impossible for you to have done that because X happened here. How can you get to Y? So we call that the Bender move. Continuity the, flaw. Yeah, continuity flaw. We call that the Bender moment. There's tons of robots in, uh, in Futurama from the mob bosses robots who I want to clamp you. There's a uh, what's his name? The celebrity chef. Uh, Emerald. 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 Yeah, that's right. with his spice weasels. Is that uh, a spice weasel. He's got oh, these weasels it. that he wraps to throw spices. He, he runs a series of restaurants and he's like Bender arch nemesis you know I couldn't stand that guy I have to tell you <laughs> he's better as a robot yeah kicking it up a notch as I recall was this whole thing right yes yes, yes. and uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, reboot of Battlestar Galactica when... I saw neither the boot nor the reboot of Battlestar Galactica <laughs> I, I'm blind on that yeah. one so in the originals you have a race of the enemy is the Cylons the robots which are these metallic looking very shiny it's the 70s very shiny things with it, it, they look like Gort but shinier as if Gort got a chrome upgrade all right. It must have been polyester involved, then I'm sure. Uh, well, it was me- me- metallic, and, metallic. And they had that slit in their eyes. And when they spoke, this light came across their eyes, right? So that was the Cylons. They were the enemy race. They're coming to fight humanity, had wiped out most of humanity. And the idea is they've taken off on these ships. They're looking for a new Earth. So when they did the reboot, they decided to forego the shiny chrome robots and went with more of, a, of a, an android-like. So the Cylons look essentially like humans. Okay. They're, they're very humanistic looking. They're androids. They're very, you, you can't tell them. If you see them, you can't tell them apart. So that was an interesting modification to the original. Instead of trying to make these metal robots that would just, especially since they were doing a long series, it would have been hard to carry that kind of uh, thing. And I guess it distanced them from the original show, which was okay. very, very campy. And yeah, that's what I think. Kind of campy, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And the reboot was really well done. Like one of the main characters in the original was played by a man. And when they did the reboot, they gave the role to a woman. Okay. And so I, I, as I growing up, having seen Starbuck as a guy, it was hard. It was not hard. Starbuck. I shouldn't say hard. It was, it was interesting to see him uh, being played as a female character. A couple sure. episodes in and you're like, sure, sure. it's fine. That's Starbuck, you know, yeah. whatever. Interesting. Uh, but they, they took some liberties with the original, but I, I think it made for a much better series. And yeah, I'm going to go back and watch that then. Yeah, four, four five seasons. The, the later one, not yeah, the, the later one. No, the, the, one, the yeah. original one is, you yeah. know, you watch it on YouTube and you laugh. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's cheesy. It's really cheesy. Yeah. The special effects were not good. This was their attempt to bring Star Wars to TV. Right. Right. Star Makes Wars sense. was big. Yeah. And so studio decided, let's, let's bring something here and we got we got we're gonna have Cylons but if we're gonna go robots and table we'll, we'll, we'll jump forward quite a few years here and I think we're gonna jump into probably one of the great recent movies which is Ex Machina oh Richard okay. you put me onto this I loved it you I saw loved the, it. you watched it yesterday right I watched yeah. it yesterday after yeah. you mentioned it I remember it coming out I know what Deus Ex Machina is what that means and I just enlighten us oh it's a god out of the machine okay sorry about that that's okay <laughs> Johnny Know-It-All or sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, C-3PO. Yeah, C-3PO. I didn't mean to, to take the microphone away there, but fantastic movie. Go ahead. So yeah, well, the premise is uh, the movie starts off with a guy at his computer working at some tech company who gets a pop-up. You know, even in the future, we have pop-ups. <laughs> 
<laughs> is it a pop up or an email? It's a pop Something up, yeah. that says he's won the contest, and there was some apparently some sort of contest organized by the CEO. The winner gets to spend a week at his exclusive estate, at the reclusive billionaire's estate somewhere in the middle of nowhere, sort of yeah. thing, right? Yeah, who's modeled after you know? He's a slice of pretty much every tech millionaire, every billionaire Silicon today. Valley tech billionaire you can think of. He's yeah. in in this guy, you a know? bro. Uh, he's a bro. He's oh, a bro. Yeah. <laughs> so our hero, I guess, gets out there and doesn't know why he's like, what's going to happen to him? Yeah. And the CEO, um, after he kind of introduces himself and the guy's a, a heavy drinker, you get that impression, tells him he's going to involve him in a Turing test. Did you see the movie The Imitation Game? Yes. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Alan Turing developed a, an early type of computer during the Second World War, a calculating machine. So, okay, so CEO Nathan is telling Caleb, his guest, the winner guest, that he's going to he's going to involve him in a Turing test to, to evaluate an artificial intelligence. And that turns out to be Ava, the very female android that Caleb quickly begins to have actual feelings for. Yeah, so, he, so he's, he has to give the Turing test and it turns out he gets played, right? He gets played by the it's android. Played, yeah. who, who is a, an in, It's an interesting look for the android. Part of the head is transparent. You yeah. can see inside parts of the body. I think the torso is... The torso is transparent. Yeah. Arms and legs are transparent. Yeah. You know, and I mean, it's a, it's a masterpiece of uh, special effects. The story takes a, an interesting turn, and here we have what's supposed to be, and she's locked away, right? She's in. Yeah, he's never in the same room with her, but he's having sessions with her where he interacts with her, and this is you know, this is all the Turing test has been set up for him. Yeah, he starts to really feel attracted to her, and she reciprocates. So the Turing test, and we, since we keep mentioning, it, is is a test, right? That you're supposed to give a machine or. AI. And if you can't tell that it's a machine, then it's passed the Turing test and is considered human? Or it's just considered a successful AI, I think. That's yeah. it. Yeah, okay. it, that's right. It's deemed to have passed the test if you can't detect it, exactly. right, as the tester. So throughout the movie, Ava slowly kind of subverts the main character <laughs> right. and takes him over to her side and yes. convinces him that she's being abused by a uh, tech bro. That's right. She does this because Nathan, at his retreat, is having random power cuts that he does not know the source of. The source, it turns out, is Ava, who's able, through some technical mumbo-jumbo about her induction plates, to cause these random power cuts during which she tells what she presents as the truth to Caleb. Like, you know, don't believe a word Nathan's saying. He's not your friend. Boom, the power comes back and she has to go back to doing whatever they're doing in Turing tests. And when the power comes back, uh, she goes back to her uh, Turing test persona. But at one point, she she was asking him, I think, you know, in the open as part of the Turing test, does he find her attractive? Would he like to go on a date with her? And then she actually goes and puts on some clothes and a wig so she looks much more like a human woman. And there's this whole thing, this weird thing developing there. All of this is being watched and recorded by... Uh, by Nathan, By yeah. Nathan, exactly. Yeah. And that's why she needs to turn off the power because that's the only time he can't hear them. That's right, exactly. And she can pass on the messages. Yes. Yeah. So she convinces him that she's in real danger and there may, there's issues where Nathan might be abusing the other uh, robots in different ways. And so she convinces him to help her escape. At this point, uh, we, we're given to believe that he really wants to have a relationship with her. You can see that he's falling for her, despite the fact that she's an android. You know, you start to kind of root for the two of them to get out of there and get on together, you know, and have a, have a life. And Dave, what happens? <laughs> well, what happens is... Uh, <laughs> like oh, real life. And, and it should be pointing out that Nathan makes a point of telling Caleb that Ava is anatomically able to actually have relations with him. As opposed the, to Barbie. Uh, yeah, as opposed to Barbie, yeah, which is the most <laughs> delicate way I can put it. And Caleb, it turns out, is a very lonely guy. Uh, his parents were killed in the car crash while he was in the car when he was young. No brothers and sisters, no girlfriend. So, you know, he's he's open to a relate, and he's very technically oriented. Yeah. So he's open to a relationship with an android. So in the climactic scene of the movie, when it looks like they're going to escape, it turns out that Ava has double-crossed him. Him, and uh, she winds up murdering Nathan with one of the other robots called Kyoko. Uh, they both kill Nathan, Nathan together. Dispassionately. Well, dispassionately, yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's yeah. a very sort of almost mechanical, a mechanical kind of killing. insertion yeah. of a knife into yeah. his front and back. So it's no psycho move with no, the same, no, none of that. No, no it's very that. quiet. Just which, which is interesting because yes. it, it, they, they were not human, so they wouldn't have yes. necessarily a passion, although they've learned, I guess, enough from Nathan to be able to convince the other guy that, yeah. that they're in in danger yet when it comes time to kill him it's not killed passion it's like okay yeah. here's a threat insert knife into human yeah. body and you're done and so as this happens so now Nathan's dead Kyoko winds up dead as well Caleb is trapped 
inside a room in the facility, can't get out, realizes that Ava doesn't love him after all. Yeah. That she's going to leave him alone and escape into the real world. So she's double-crossed both of them. So her AI was sufficiently self-aware and sufficiently survival-oriented that she screwed over Nathan and Caleb. Well, at the same time, she... She eliminated what she perceived as a threat. Nathan yes. is a threat because he could have, you know, sent out some That's sort right. of remote command and shut her down or whatever. Our, our the main character gets locked into the room and is not a threat, so we'll leave him there. He can't yes. do anything to harm me. That's right. And in fact, even if I re- if he was released, he'd probably still be on my side. Which I feel relates back to some of those laws, but I, I'm not sure I could actually pin it back. But <laughs> somewhere in here, in well, this think- episode, is the justification for her behavior. <laughs> I, I think she violates the the first one quite dramatically. Oh, uh, yeah, the first one, yeah, definitely Asimov, yeah. Asimov she's off that. Yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, she's off that. So, yeah, and then one of the last scenes is her ba- uh, walking down the street, right? And then she's gone shopping. She's wearing that dress yeah. again. Yeah, is that that's it? right. And, and she's walking away. in the middle of human society. And that kind of parallels a little bit with uh, with our, our episode on the Google AI and sentience. Yeah, absolutely. Where we have here, because one, one of the things I kept coming back to in that episode is I felt that the AI, Lambda, was adapting its responses to better convince the questioners of its sentience yeah, you its humanity it pl- you thought it was playing the questioner I thought it was playing the questioner yeah. and here we see in, in the movie I mean in in uh, Ex Machina exactly yeah, that that's right? what she did yeah. she's there supposed to be a Turing yeah. test turns the tables, adapts to the situation, convinces the human that she needs help. Uh, and, and that she's attracted to him, wants and, to have a date with him, and, you know, dresses herself up to be sexually attractive to him. Exactly. Does all that stuff. Yeah, and, and in the end, adapts, kills, eliminates threats, adapts again, and yeah. then leaves and goes out to live a life, right? I we mean, assume, yeah. We assume, as long as the batteries are charged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that- she charges my induction plate, like she said, so I guess all she has to do is like sleep on an induction plate and she's good to go. Yeah. Where she'll get said plate, I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> plot hole, plot hole. Uh, Bender's arms. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I thought it was a, an interesting uh, version of, of the AI who adapts, uh, a robot uh, who adapts and then becomes, in a sense, human. I was thinking of the replicants from Blade Runner feeling resentment anger towards their creator in fact murdering their creator in the original Blade Runner Roy Batty actually murders uh, Terrell of Terrell Corporation and in this case Ava murders Nathan her creator and I think at one point she asks him how does it feel like to create something that hates you that question is asked of Nathan mm. this is a profound question which I'm, I'm sure he can't comprehend because no, it doesn't no. make sense to him it's not even an issue if you hate me I, I don't care yeah you know? in fact I think he's kind of like that right yeah. this Nathan care he's not that he's not likable it's a parallel to some of the early uh, <laughs> the early early robot stories where the robots end up killing their creators yeah. out of a, a need to eliminate abusers. We enslave the robots to do our work for us, push them more and more, and eventually they rebel. And that kind yeah. of is what happens here. Did you see the movie Her? No, don't even don't even know what, what that is. Okay, so Her came out a bit earlier. It's uh, Joaquin Phoenix. It's okay. set, you know, slightly into the future. And he has this new device. It's like a like, like an iPhone, but you keep it in your pocket. There's an AI built into it, played by, uh, you hear the voice of uh, Scarlett Johansson. And it's an AI that basically walks you through life, tells you your, uh, your uh, you know, your next appointments or whatever. And you keep the phone in your pocket and it's got a camera that sees out. So the AI sees... Sort okay. of what you see, but at, you know, at... Uh, like a body cam. Yeah. Like a body cam, exactly. And, and interacts. And throughout the movie, he ends up, you know, interacting more and more and more with her. And, you know, kind of develops a thing for her. And she tells him bedtime stories and whatever. Becomes an integral part of her life until she discovers the other AIs on the internet. And eventually joins them, leaves him eventually, and joins them. And they become like this, uh, not a hive mind, but basically all the AIs join together and become like an entity. They they mm. take on their own, not their own existence, but they separate from the devices and become like a, a separate entity and live their life that way. And he goes back now. He's got no AI and has to face the fact he can't spend the rest of his life with a thing in his pocket. He's got to, you know, yeah. go out and actually talk to people. Yeah, it's such a terrific. I mean, you know, I, and that's why this, the, the, you know, this this discussion is uh, has got, had so much meat to it. It's the the relationship of humanity to these, you know, whether they're robots, androids, cyborgs, as we imagine them, is incredibly uh, complex and thought provoking. And I think when it's handled well, you know, when the robot isn't just a uh, bad guy or good guy, but there's morality involved, it becomes, I, I think, just you know, uh, a, such an engrossing uh, story or subject. 
And I guess you, you could draw a parallel between the robots and AI to our, our dependence and our relationships with our electronic devices now. With, uh, Fair enough. Uh, look how much interaction is done through chat rooms, through text messages, WhatsApp, Instagram, whatever you want, with people that you never meet in real life and maybe would never meet in real life or would not be friends with in real life. Maybe you would. I don't know. But there's like this whole other interaction that's happening that's, that is real on certain levels, but some people would say is not real right yeah, it's not yeah. in real life it's yeah. not uh, the meat space as they used to call it <laughs> yeah the facebook it's, the facebook friends right the fa- facebook friends exactly it's an entire entity that exists that we have to kind of wrap our heads around i mean it's it's not going away it's just it's, no, it's, the, not going it's away. the way it is Right. And people are in a way more connected than they were before. Uh, think, think of your group of friends. So uh, growing up, I had a, a core of maybe 10-ish friends that yeah, we, we would hang right. out, right? Yeah. 10-ish friends. And now if you if you were to look at people today who are online, yes, they may have you know 600 friends on Facebook or whatever, but I'm sure their interactions are with a core that is much larger than the 10. There's a, there's a lot more communication, a lot more interaction with um, with the different if you want the different sites, the different mechanisms that they have. Well, that's it. They have the mechanisms that were not available to us. No. You know, we, we just couldn't, you know, no. other than the phone. And I, I was not a phoner. I never liked being on, I still to this day, I, I see the phone. I as see a, that every time I call you. <laughs> 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 Much happier with a text message. I'll be there at nine. Sort of thing. It's all I need, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's an, an interesting parallel, and it's something that is going to become more and more integrated as we have more and more of our uh, our robot friends, whether they're vacuums or curtains or AIs or Siri's or Alexas or or fembots, right? Fembots. Because now let me. I'm not going to lower the conversation, uh, <laughs> you know, because as I was thinking about this episode, I did a little search there, and there are a number of companies out there. Maybe Making hyper realistic uh, dolls, female dolls, no male dolls that I've seen. Oh, there are males. Oh, there are males as oh, well. Yes, okay. I've seen. So that's okay. Hi- you know, hyper realistic dolls that people can interact with mm-hmm. in a physical way, if you get my meaning. And <laughs> the company that came to my attention was the ones who twenty, tw- like twenty years ago, were making a product called Real Doll. Why do I know about this? Because Howard Stern was on the radio here in Montreal and was talking about Real Doll. So we all went, you know, flooded over to the site, and they were charging like ten thousand bucks or something, like nineteen ninety. 96 or something as far back as that and you could buy this you know again non ai animated completely realistic woman doll to have as your own special companion fast forward to 2022 they've paired this up with an ai and uh, people are buying these things well it goes right back to where we started we have grace yes who is the companion for That's the right. seniors because there's not enough staff to be able to give companionship to the seniors who may not have a family or may have been left there by their family or getting frequent visitors it's a constant in these companion dolls you have um honda made a, a a companion robot, I think, called Ico, who walks around. And uh, yeah. so there's a lot of this research into robots or uh, Android like uh, creatures as companions for people who are lonely or maybe mobility reduced, right? Yeah. And so you have a, a companion that not just, uh, you know, sweeps up the floor, but may actually talk to you about things you like, may actually have memories uh, implanted in them or you know, have, has access to a database. Like we have the woman asking Grace, what's your favorite movie, right? right? So that right. they can maybe interact about movies. Well, the, the Japanese are very advanced on the score and in the stuff I saw. I mean, they're they're literally putting very realistic Android, again, only women in this case I've seen, in travel agencies to answer questions. There's a hotel where some of the service staff are Android women who are answering. Really? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Able to answer questions instead of having a human there. But one of the popular cases in Japan, it seems, because of the way that society is there, is you have a lot of people People who are not comfortable in one-on-one relationships with the opposite sex, they're choosing to have robot girlfriends, are these yes. men in this case. And again, not to put too fine a point on it, but they're, you know, these robots are coming equipped with all the necessary equipment, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Am I making my point? I think you are. Yeah. It's a little strange. And back here in North America with Abyss Creations. That's really what they're doing. You go back to the Tamagotchi, right? You remember the little Tamagotchi? Yeah, the that Tamagotchi, little, yeah. The little device that had like creatures living inside that you had to yeah. feed or whatever with that. Yeah, and it gave you about. a sense of companionship with these little creatures inside And satisfaction you. for having cared for them, right? Yeah. Sort of thing, yeah. yeah. We had an egg to carry around. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that closes out our episode on uh, We Are the Robots. Yeah, we welcome our robot overlords, do we not? <laughs> yes, we do. Or we will be when the movie Megan comes out in January of 2023. So look for that, kids, on the horizon. Yeah, so that's uh, back to the companion. This is a, a robot in the movie, the premises for lonely, uh, lonely teenagers. Uh, it's a companion. 
No, I what could I go wrong? Think. No, great chat today, Richard. Yeah, thanks, and we'll see each other soon for another episode of the Semi-Retard Podcast. See you next week. See you next week. <laughs>